Once more, the Big Bang suffers a blow. I recently reported on the discovery of young galaxies in the early universe which seem to have evolved too quickly, calling into question the timeline of the Big Bang. Now in a piece of research published last week, astronomers have been trying to peer back into time as far as possible, hunting for the elusive Population 3 stars. These stars should be the only stars in the early universe. Yet no matter how far back they look, they cannot find them. Let's examine the story of these elusive Population 3 stars. Confusingly, Population 3 stars are thought to be the first generation of stars. These are the first stars to have been created, forged from the primordial material that emerged from the Big Bang. They would contain only hydrogen, helium and lithium, and no heavy elements would be present. This should be a relatively straightforward task. Look back far enough and you should start to see more and more Population 3 stars. In order to do this, they developed a new technique that allowed them to see much further than has ever been possible. This allowed them to see galaxies 10 to 100 times fainter than any previous observations. They were able to examine objects that they think are aged between 500 million and 1 billion years after the Big Bang. The problem was, when they looked back, all they saw were low-mass galaxies, which they believe support the idea that these helped re-ionize the universe. This is a period after the Big Bang, when the neutral intergalactic medium was thought to be ionized by the first stars and galaxies. Of course, we may consider this to be totally back to front, but let's not digress too early on. The problem is that there really shouldn't be this many galaxies that early on. And this means that the galaxies formed much earlier than they had previously thought. The fact that they see no Population 3 stars they use also as evidence to support this idea, and suggest that they must have formed even earlier, hence why we do not observe them. Let's just take a step back and break this down a little. Firstly, we need to come back to how they measure the age of an object that is this distant. The only tool that they can use with objects this distant is redshift and there are two components that they think can cause this, the recessional velocity and the cosmic redshift. The first is how quickly an object is moving away from us. The faster it is moving, the more redshifted it becomes. In the Big Bang, the assumption is that everything started at the same point, so objects that are further away would need to be traveling at a much greater speed. Add into this that the universe itself needed to be expanding in this model, and this too will stretch the light. So in a nutshell, the higher the redshift, the faster it is moving, the further away it is. Light travels at a fixed speed, therefore the light that we are receiving from these objects originated a long time ago. So if it is a billion light years away, the light that we are just receiving is from one billion years ago. But this all assumes that the redshift can only come from these two mechanisms. As I have discussed many times, this is not the only way redshift can be created. Halt and Art believed that quasars were highly redshifted, not because of their remote distance or speed, but because intrinsically they emitted light in the redder end of the spectrum. He lent on the variable mass concept Nalikar came up with to explain how this happened. As the objects aged, its light would change to a bluer colour. The problem is that this by itself cannot explain all the redshift we see either. The majority of the galaxies are indeed redshifted. There are also clear bands of blue shift when we examine our local neighbourhood. This is interpreted as a movement of galaxies towards the great attractor. But as I have argued before, this could easily be interpreted a totally different way. We must also consider interactions the light has on its travels from the object to the observer. Plasma redshift and plasma blue shift occur when light passes through a medium where the electron density either decreases or increases. Extreme variants of this are how we explain why the electron beams ejected from pulsars and quasars emit X-rays. It is not the object that emits these tight X-ray beams. Instead, it is believed that the photons collide with relativistic electrons which gives them a kick, 
and causes them to become a higher frequency. This is called inverse Compton scattering. This is actually a topic that I would like to look at in further detail, especially with a connection to pulsars. For now, I think it's important to realize that redshift is caused by a combination of all of these factors. So the first point to note is that these objects that they are observing may not be the old relics that they think they are. They may equally not be as far away as they think. Now, this does not mean that I think that they're right on our doorstep, nor that the universe is much smaller than it is. The idea of age and hence distance is really only linked in the Big Bang model. If instead you imagine that the universe itself just existed, I know this might seem like a strange concept, but I want to make you see how much of our concepts of both distance and age are linked to this explosion model from the Big Bang. If the redshift that we see is indeed a combination of the factors mentioned above, then some of this may indeed be due to motion. How much? We don't know. Differences in redshift may be more to do with other factors than the motion itself. In fact, in some sense, it might tell us more about the age than anything else. This means that we have no way of telling how old an object is. The light that we receive from a highly redshifted object may be billions of light years away, or maybe not. There is no way of telling from the light that we receive. And I think this is why it is so hard for them to let go of the redshift equals age concept. As without this, we literally have nothing to tell us age or distance. Instead, we need to get smarter about understanding the factors that can affect light and use this to build a different picture that shows not only how this might be created intrinsically, but also what factors might affect the light on its path to us. The second problem is the assumption about the stars and what they are, and the fact that population three stars come before population two and population one stars. As we have discussed in Jürgen's Electric Sun series, the difference between population one and population two may be more to do with the supply of electrons than it is to do with the materials that the star was made from. Again here, the idea is that population two stars are older and have less metals in them compared to population one stars, which are thought to be created from the remnants of population two stars. No population three stars to date have ever been observed. They have discovered some very metal poor population two stars hiding in the Milky Way spiral arms. Finding them in the spiral arms is also strange, as these are thought to be much more recent formations, and you would expect to find population two stars in the center of the galaxy, not in the spiral arms. Again, if we consider the stars to be electric, then this is just a star that is electron deficient and is not creating as many heavy elements in its atmosphere. If stars are electric, then we would expect them to produce a certain amount of heavier elements in their atmosphere. Population three stars simply would not exist, which is exactly what we are seeing. As always, be brave, be curious, the truth is waiting for us. Until next time.